now for this privilege to call upon thee. Lord, again, I pray this morning you'd help us around the Word of God. Lord, I pray that you bless it. God, help me today. Father, I'm incapable of delivering, God, the message unless you come. Lord, unless you come around. Oh, God, we know we need your help. And I pray right now, God, the sweet Spirit of God, Lord, but move, Lord, behind this pulpit and up and down these aisles. God, in between these pews, I pray the sweet Spirit of God would move and help and bless us today. God, use us for thy glory in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a story of Boaz, and he is redeeming uh, Ruth. And we find if, you're, if, you've, if you've been here on Sunday night, Wednesday night, we've had a good time around this little book of Ruth, talking about what Ruth, where Ruth was, where she came from, who Boaz was, and what he was. And now we come to the place where uh, Boaz is making a decision whether or not, he, you know, whether or not he's going to redeem Ruth. And it all lies uh, within another that is a, more of a near kinsman than he is. The story of redemption is thus, when a man... Uh, in the Old Testament times when a man uh, died and he left his wife without children, then it was up to his brother, if he wasn't married, it was up to him to take that, uh, to take that brother's wife and raise up a child, uh, a man-child, you know, to that woman so that their family name could continue on. There was nothing wrong with that. That was the way things happened. And so that was, a, that was a tradition, that was something that uh, to carry the name on, then they're the next of kin, the near kinsman of that husband uh, would, would take on that uh, woman and, and have children with them and hopefully a male to carry on the uh, next generation. So that one never washed today. I know of a few instances where that has washed and that has happened, but it's very rare in this day today. But I'll tell you something, it comes to the place where Ruth, is uh, Ruth is Boaz is a near kinsman to Ruth, but there is one that is nearer than than uh, Boaz to Ruth. So we find this story right here, and I'm going to read you just a little bit about that. Then I'm going to preach to you on the connection between as Boaz is uh, to Ruth, how Christ is to us. So simply the title of the message was the redemption of Ruth. The redemption of Ruth, or simply redemption this morning. Ruth chapter number 4, Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake, for he said back in chapter 3, There is one that is nearer than I. When this kinsman come by, Boaz is at the gate. And as he's at the gate with, with some other uh, leaders, apparently Boaz was a great man in the city and he was a leader. But as, as he sat there with those others, those other judges, and they came up, here come that near kinsman, and he says unto him, Oh, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and said, and he said Come here, I want to talk to you. I've got something to discuss with you. And in that day, everything they did was held at the city gate. They would catch people coming to work and going to work. And when there was something that needed to be discussed or something that needed to be worked out, they'd do it right there at the gate. It's quick and a simple process. And, uh, you know, they'd make a judgment. And, and all was well. It worked well in that day. So that's what they were doing. And verse 2, And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsmen, Naomi, that is come again out of the country of Moab, selleth a parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. And I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Now, the near kinsman on the first part said, Okay, I'll redeem it. Uh, but he did not know all the stipulations to that redemption. See, they would buy, they would, if somebody was in poverty or somebody, you know, had to sell their land, then the near kinsman could come along and redeem that for them so that the land would remain in their possession. But then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy it also of, the, of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. So he said, Now when you buy this property, when you buy this land, when you redeem it, uh, you're also going to have to marry Ruth and uh, you're going to get her along with the deal. Now that changed the whole story around for this, uh, 
this other fellow. So, and the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, why couldn't he redeem it? He was a married man. And so he, he did not want to mar his own inheritance with his own children by raising up children to somebody else, and that would, that would mess up his whole, uh, you know, his whole affair. So he said, I cannot redeem it. You go ahead and redeem it. So now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing. For to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and this was a testimony in Israel. Now that's some way to do it, ain't it? Walk around with one shoe the rest of your life. But he had just one shoe and he took that off and he gave it to him. That was for a sign of a, of a testimony that, you know, as like a vow or like a pledge. Okay, you can go ahead and do this. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, Buy it for thee, for he drew off his shoe. Boaz said unto the elder, to all the people, Ye are witness this day that I have brought all, uh, the, bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. Ye are witnesses this day and all the people that were in the gate and the elders said we are witnesses the Lord make the woman uh, that is coming to thine house like Rachel and like Leah which too did build the house of Israel and do thou worthily in Ephrata and be famous in Bethlehem and let the house be like the house of Pharez whom Tamar bare unto Judah of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman so Boaz took Ruth and she was his wife and when he went into her the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. So we see here the wonderful story of the redemption of, of Boaz to Ruth. Now, I want to make some comparison here this morning. I'll not keep you over an hour and a half. Amen. So you be you pray. You say, I preach. You going to preach that long? Probably not. Uh, I always say this. If you listen fast and pray fast, I'll preach fast. All right? But if you listen slow, then it'll take me longer to get the message to you. Amen. So you, you pray hard and I'll preach fast, all right? But here we go. And we see here that Boaz was the one that knew all about Ruth. Now he'd done his homework. He knew that, that, uh, that Elimelech was his brother, of course. And he knew that Naomi was his wife. Now Naomi was above uh, the years of a uh, barren child, so it wasn't that he would take her. But, but uh, Ruth, the Moabitess, uh, he was the one that, I mean, she was the one that he was interested in. And uh, he knew all about her. He'd done his homework. He found out all about her, where she came from. He knew that she was a Gentile. He knew that, she, hey, hallelujah to God, I'm glad the Gentiles have a place in the family of God. Hey, man, I'll throw that in. I'm glad that me being a Gentile did not exclude me from being with Jesus forever and ever. Hey, Amen. All because of the purchase price of Jesus on Calvary. And then we find that, that as, as Ruth, uh, as she began to glean in the field, Boaz took exception to her. Now, it's not said that she was a beautiful lady physically. I imagine she was, but it didn't say it. But what drawed Boaz's attention to Ruth is that the whole city declared that she was a woman of virtue. She was a virtuous woman. And that fulfills Proverbs chapter number 31. And so she understood that, that, you know, he understood that she was a virtuous woman by testimony of the community. So he was interested in her. And then he found out all about uh, that they needed to be redeemed. So he did everything right. He knew about her. He knew about her poverty. And that didn't bother him that she was in poverty. It didn't bother him that he being a man of wealth and there was a peasant lady, so to speak, and she was down there gleaning after the reapers. No, he took to her, and he found out who she was, and he told her, he said, you let her, let her have a little handful on purpose once in a while. You deal her out a little bit extra once in a while. Let me say right there, friend, I'm glad that sometimes Jesus in heaven, he'll see us struggling, amen. He'll see us in, uh, having a hard time in life, but once in a while he'll say, well, I'll throw you a little handful on purpose to get you by, amen. I'll give you a little extra blessing. I'll put you up a little closer and then hug you up a little tighter and I'll give you a little handful on blessing to help you along your way. And that's what he did to Ruth. He gave her a handful of blessing. He knew about her. He knew about her, her poverty. He knew about her husband that had died. He knew that she was a widow. He knew about 
his, her mother-in-law eliminate, and he knew that she needed redemption by the next of kin. So he knew Naomi, he knew all these things about her. Now let me say this to you, friend, this morning. God knows all about you and I. We have nothing hid from God. God knew us before the foundation of the world. God knew who we were. He knew that we were sinners in need of a Savior. He knew that we needed redemption. He knew about our past. He knew what we were going to be when we were born into this world. I look back over my life and I wonder why God in heaven would save such a wretch as I. I wonder why He would put up with me. But God knew what I was going to be. He knew what I am today. He knows what I'm going to be. And yet God in heaven loved me. He loved me enough to pay redemptive price. See, Boaz loved Ruth enough to pay for the, the price of her redemption. Now, I don't know what the, what the amount was in money, but it wasn't cheap. But I know what the amount was for my soul, friend. It was the blood of Christ on the cross of Calvary. That was the price that it would take to pay for my redemption. But hallelujah, one day Jesus said, I'll pay that redemption price. I'll pay for them with my blood on the cross of Calvary and Christ knowing, knowing what it would cost, he was willing to pay my sin debt and redeem me by his own blood. Not by the blood of bulls or goats. No, no, that wouldn't do. The blood of, uh, bull and go uh, the blood of bulls and goats in the Old Testament was simply a sign and a type of the blood of Christ. <coughs> that he was to shed on the cross of Calvary for me. So all that being a sign and all that being a type, Boaz was willing to pay the price and Jesus was willing to pay the price for my redemption. He knew, Boaz also knew that, that Ruth could not escape poverty. The only way for Ruth to escape her poverty was that if she was redeemed. She, had, she was in poverty being a widow. The widow that day, if, if no one were to redeem them or look out for them, they had to do all they could, the best they could, to get by. So Boaz knew that and he had a plan for her redemption. God knew that we were in poverty. He knew that when we were lost without Him, without God and His Son, that we'd struggle through life just to get by. Friend, my life was a life of poverty before I got saved in the grace of God. My life was ruined and wrecked by sin and by the devil. But one day, Jesus, I understood that He knew my poverty and He knew me and He saw me in my need and He offered me a way out of poverty. Amen. They say many Americans today would love to get out of poverty if they just knew how. Well, I don't have the answer to the to America's financial problem, but I've got, a, I've got an answer to America's sin trouble. I've got an answer to America's people that are in poverty because of sin sickness, and I'll tell you exactly what that is today, friend. It's the Lord Jesus Christ because He paid my way out of poverty. Hallelujah. Now, I've not since I got saved, I've not always had everything that I've ever wanted or ever desired, so to speak, but I've had all God said that I needed. Amen. He's prepared for me and He's made ways for me because I was in pro I'm not, hey, I'm not struggling along no more. Amen. I'm not struggling along in sin anymore trying to figure out how to feel good the next day. Amen. By the grace of God, I'm saved by His grace and if I look to Him every day, there is no doubt in my mind that I'll have peace in my heart. Amen. Why? Because Jesus paid my way out of poverty. Now, what's a lost man doing? He's, well, he's wandering around in poverty today. He may have all the money in the world. I think of the rich people of the world. But the richest man on earth, if he's not saved by the grace of God, is living in poverty. And all the riches that he's got cannot do anything for his spiritual poverty. He'll buy the biggest boat. He'll buy the, the, the fastest jet airplane. He'll find the nicest cars. He'll have a mansion on every hillside around. On all the coast, on all the beaches, he'll have the nicest piece of property. But guess what? He's never satisfied. He's never happy. Because he's always looking for something. Always looking for something else to make him happy. But I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have him than riches untold. I'd rather be his than anything I know. Why? Because Jesus may have paid my way out of poverty when he redeemed. Spiritually speaking. Now, since I've been saved, I found I've had some rough places in my life. And I guess everybody here has had some rough places in your life. Maybe sickness, maybe financial poverty. 
There's nothing wrong with that, but Jesus will take care of you. Jesus will see you through every day, every way. Jesus will always take care of you because he knows that you're in poverty. Boaz knew that Ruth was in poverty and could, had no way out except somebody redeem her. Hallelujah, Jesus saw me in my poverty and he knew that I'd never get to him. I'd never enjoy the goodness of God except my, the redemption price be paid and he paid it all on the cross of Calvary. He knew my poverty and he paid my sin debt. He knew that she had the poverty of being a beggar. And that's why she was. Ruth was a beggar because she had no crops to glean of her own. She had no fields to go forth in her own that she had raised to glean what was necessary to get by with food. So she went to everybody else begging, can I glean in your field? So it just happened so that she landed upon, oh glory just happened so that she landed on the field of Boaz by the grace of God in God's plan and she began went to the gleaners <coughs> or she went to the harvester and said can I glean in your field and they said sure you can glean in our field so she had to beg to glean in the field but then she began to glean and Boaz happened to see her the woman in poverty had to beg for what she had, but, but Boaz saw her begging. Friend, when we were in poverty and sin, we were begging. We were begging for help. We were wanting for help. You know what's wrong with a lot of people today in their sin sickness and a lot of people today in their sin and the disease of sin and the, and the way they live and the corruption that they live in and the, and the hard sins that they, you know, that they do and the crimes they commit? They're begging for attention from somebody. Listen, society can't do but so much. You, you give people all they want to, all you want to give them, but if, you know, if people w want to continue to live the way they're going to live, that's what they're going to do, no matter what you do for them. What's the matter with the society today is that they're lost without God and they're begging and what they need is what I've got. Amen. God help me when I see someone in need begging for spiritual things that I've been in a place where I can feed them. Nothing wrong with feeding people. I don't, I'm, I'm not opposed to that at all. I bought, people, I bought hungry people many meals. But I think of what God did for me. How that as poverty stricken as I was, without Him, He had exactly what I needed. And He let me come and glean in the field till He redeemed me. Amen. And I was there in the right place at the right time. Browns Chapel Baptist Church, when Jesus reached down and He, pay, and he paid it, He paid it all for me. And I accepted him as my Savior. Boaz was the only way that Ruth, Ruth could escape her poverty. And Boaz was the only one that could provide for her. Now he was the only one. Nobody else could. The other, the, the other kinsmen would not provide for her, would not redeem her. Boaz was the only one that could provide for her what she needed. And he provided her by, by letting her glean in the field. And he provided for her by redeeming her and by marrying her and making her his wife. What has that got to do with the Lord? Let me tell you again, he was the only one that could provide for me what I needed. How am I going to get to God? I've done established that I was in poverty. I was, I've already established that I, was, that I was lost without God and I had no way to get to God how, was, how am I going to be provided for when Jesus saw that and he's the only one that could provide for me? I could, what could I do good enough to get to God? What could Ruth do good enough as a beggar? What could she do to get to Boaz? Nothing. She could only glean in his field unless he had mercy on her. That was what she was going to be. Oh, friend, I was, I was lost without God and the only hope that I had was Jesus. No other way. How else am I going to get to God? I'll be good enough. Boy, you all know me well enough. No, that never happened. Amen. Some people say I'm just full of meanness. It's not meanness. It's mischief, okay? <laughs> Don't you laugh. Just because you've known me all my life. Well, she can't. She can't. She lives with me every day. <laughs> but y'all, I mean, I mean I've, I've never been a real bad man. But I've done a lot, <coughs> I would, but
But I've done a lot of things that I'm not proud of in life. So I look at my life, and if it was up to me, I'd never get to God. There's no way I myself could get to God and get my way out of, out of poverty of sin. No way. I can't be good enough. I couldn't be good enough. I don't have the money. If it, if it took money, I'd never, I'd never be able to pay my way. Why, how, why, how could you put a dollar amount on heaven, friend? You can't. The richest man on earth cannot get to God by buying his way in. And by the way, there's, after you're dead and gone, there's nobody else going to be able to buy your way into heaven. You're lost without God. When you die, you're on your way to hell, and you'll spend eternity there, and there's no man be able to pay your way out of hell. And that goes on in a lot of religions. Give me enough money, and I'll pray him out of purgatory. Nope, ain't going to happen. You determine where you're going to spend eternity in this life. So if I can't pay my way out of it, if I haven't been good enough, can I be good enough to get to God? Is there anything I can do? I mean, if, if I turned into a, a, to a, to a, a, a man that just went, that'd never happen. Never in this life would this happen. But I, I turned into a person that put himself away from society. And I was no longer around anybody. I'd die of boredom in about three days probably. But if I put myself away and I was around nobody, I was around nothing, I had nothing to look at, I had nothing to read, I had nothing but the, the Bible to read and I had no TV, you know why I wouldn't be good enough? You know why that wouldn't be good enough? Because the devil plays with your mind, amen? And there's always going on something in that brain. There ain't nothing you can do to get to God. There is nothing you can do to pay your way out of poverty. The only one that can provide for you, and hallelujah, has already done it. Is Jesus Christ. Boy, I'm glad he did. I, I told this before, I'll tell it again. After I got called to preach, and this, what led, this taught me a great lesson. After I got called to preach, my wife remembers it well. I come home and that was, you know, I, I'm preaching now, so I got to be altogether different. And I can't have fun no more. Now that was, that was what the devil had told me and that's what I thought was going to happen. I knew God called me to preach, but I knew that, you know, I didn't know what to do about it. I don't know nothing about that kind of stuff. So God called me to preach, and I, that, now you're going to have to put on, a, this is what old self thought, now you're going to have to put on a somber face. And when people talk to you, you're going to have to talk real straight to them, you know, with a, with a real, real strong voice, and you're not going to be able to joke. So I made it out, you know, I made out my way. That's the way I'm going to be. I'm going to go back to work and I'm going to have a somber face and, and I'm going to say yes, yes, and no, no, and I'm not going to have much conversation with people and I'm going to be a real preacher. So I went about that. Hey, how you doing? Doing okay today? Yeah, everything's good. And inside I'm a miserable, wretched wreck. And I went through that about two weeks. You asked my wife. I went through that about two weeks. And I went before God. And I said, God, if this is what it's going to take, I ain't got it. I said, if I can't be me, God, I, I can't do this if I can't be me. And God said, that's all I want is you to be you. That's all I need is somebody to give themselves to me that I might use them for who they are and what they are to do what I want. Amen. So business picked up after that. I felt a whole lot better. I felt a whole lot better when I realized that, that I couldn't be good enough to be a preacher, but I could, be, I could do what God wanted me to do and you let God use me how He wanted to use me. And friend, God will do that for you. There's nothing you can do to get to God, but there's a lot that God can do to get to you and use you. So I can't get there by my, my good preacher works. Hey, I've seen some preachers on TV that I guarantee you, they'll guarantee you they're going to heaven because of what they are and who they are. I'm a preacher so-and-so, and I've got lots of money, and I've got big cars, and I've got a TV show. And I'm going to heaven because I'm doing good. There ain't nobody ever been good enough to get to God. The Pharisees claimed that they were good enough to get to God. But guess what? They were not good enough to get to God. So no matter what you do, your works will never get you into heaven 
All the good that you can do in life, all the money you can give to the church, all the prayers that you can so-called pray will never get you to God. You must be born again. You must be redeemed out of your poverty by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way to God is through redemption, my friend. Jesus, Boaz was the only one that could pay the price for her redemption. He had the wherewithal to do so. And Jesus was the only way, only person that could pay my redemption price. And it had to do with his own precious blood. He shed his blood to pay for my redemption. See, my redemption was based upon the fact that there had to be an, a, a sacrifice made to God that would be acceptable for my sin. And you go back in, in the Old Testament, read the, the, the Levitical law, in the laws of the Old Testament, and it explains how that a bull or a goat or a turtle dove and their blood would be shed so that it would, could be offered before God as a covering for sin, as an as a act of, of uh, taking care of that sin for one year. And the high priest who had to be a holy man and he had to be, <coughs> he had to be clean and offer sacrifice for himself beforehand and he would offer sacrifice for himself and then he himself would take the blood of that sacrificed animal and he would go into the holy of holy places and he would offer that before God. And God would accept that sacrifice as a covering for man's sin. Now man still had to make sacrifice daily, but, but God would, would accept that for one year. If the, if the Listen, it's told historically that if a priest went in before God unclean himself to make sacrifice, that he would have a, a, a rope tied to his foot. And when he'd go in there, if the bells quit ringing on the hem of his garment for too long, they knew that God had, took his, that God had killed him because he wasn't clean enough, and they would drag him out. Let me tell you something, friend. God is serious business when you're talking about redemption, when you're talking about your sin debt being paid by the blood of Christ. My friend, Jesus died on the cross. He shed all of his blood on the cross and at the whipping post and that blood was gathered up somehow God gathered that blood was gathered up and Jesus himself our oh hallelujah Jesus himself our great high priest he took the blood of his own body and he offered that to God on the altar of sacrifice and God said that's an acceptable offering for the sins of mankind for all eternity well, that's how my that's how my sin debt was paid for how did I get how did I take Part in that, I accepted Him. I believed Him. I trusted His plan of salvation, not of my good works, lest any man should boast. Then last of all, Boaz was the only one that could provide for her a secure future. Boaz could provide for her a home. Boaz could pro provide for her all that he had, and when she got saved, she, she, uh, when she got redeemed, she got to be a part of all that Boaz had. And he was the one that could provide that for her. <coughs> Friend, let me say to you today that Jesus is the only one that can provide for my future. And I'm talking to you about my eternal future. Where am I going to spend eternity? I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus in heaven. What am I going to be doing for eternity? I don't know, but it sure is going to be heaven. Amen. We take pleasure in this life and do some things in this life that we enjoy. But I'm going to tell you, no matter what you enjoy down here, heaven's going to be so much sweeter and so much brighter that it'll, look the, it'll take the pleasures of this world and they'll be very dim to us and they'll be gone because of all the joys that God's got for us when we get around the throne of God. Jesus, through His Redemptive price paid on the cross of Calvary has secured my eternal future forever. Now, you know, as a child, I don't know how some of you kids may be like this, some of you may not, and some of you adults may have believed this, may have not. But I, when I was a kid growing up in church, and I'd sit in the Sunday school class, and, you know, Sunday school teachers rightly so would tell me about heaven. Preacher would preach about heaven and how to get there. And I'm glad they did because that's how I got saved. Somebody told me. But I had to, in my mind, somehow, and I don't know how I got it, that, that I would, when I got to heaven, I'd be all dressed in white, and I'd have wings and a halo 
and I could play a harp. And I would sit on a cloud. And that's what it would be. And I'm sorry, friend, but for all eternity, that might be good for a spell, but all eternity, that'd be get boring. First of all, I can't play a harp. I don't know how I'd sit on a cloud except it'd be God helping me. And one little, one little young and said this, said, I don't know about